Okay. So yeah, if you have that paper there, the the passage that um, that Dave read for us is uh, is what we're going to be looking at. Um, so today we're we're actually going to start a series through the Book of Ephesians. And so I kind of shared there that uh, a couple weeks ago that um, um, I was kind of just seeking what is it that God wants to say to us. And I've, I've shared before my question I ask myself every time preparing is, Lord, what do you want to say to your people from your word? And um, and so I've just been kind of seeking that. We're at a good place in Acts to kind of pause. And uh, and so it just, just where God's brought us from, from January, looking at the mission that Jesus gave us, we looked at Jesus' instructions to his disciples, and uh, to go and to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them everything Jesus commanded, and then we saw just how the d- disciples did that in, in Acts, right? They obeyed that command from Jesus, and they empowered by the Holy Spirit, these devoted disciples took every opportunity that God gave them, just the situations they found themselves in, boldly empowered by the Holy Spirit, being a witness to Jesus, loving one another well. And so we've been looking at that um, up to this point. And, and so we're just going to kind of take a, a pause there and, uh, and look at this, this letter, um, this book of Ephesians here up until Christmas time. Might go into January a little bit. We'll see. But um, really, just to kind of give you an idea what, uh, why, why Ephesians and kind of that discernment process. I'll let you in a little bit. I, I know I, we're all looking, asking seeking God on something. We're all making decisions every day. And so how do we discern? We've started a, a young adults Bible study, and I asked them on the first week, what do you want to talk about? What do you want to study? And they said, how to hear God's voice, you know, because that's so crucial to, to us. How do we hear? And, and so there's three three kind of things, three, three things we go to. Prayer, right? We want to hear from God. And so if we're going to hear, prayer is both talking and listening, amen? Right? It's communing. It's communicating with him. And so prayer, of course, we want to hear from God. We need to be listening. And that comes through prayer. His word, God has given us his word, his authority, just like the new members said there, this is our authority for life. And so whatever it is, whatever decision we make, it needs to align with God's word, of course. But it's not just principles and that, of course, it is that guidelines, guidance and instruction in God's word it has to align with that. But God can speak to you through his word. The Bible says it's living and active, right? And so yeah, how many people I know have asked this before, like where God, you read that verse and it was exactly what you needed for that situation of that day, right? And so he can speak to you through his word for that specific situation. And I can attest to a number of times. And so so that's the second one. The third one is through each other. And God doesn't, didn't design us to, to do this Christian life alone. We do it in community, as a body, as a church. And we all have the Holy Spirit. If you're a Christian, you have that Holy Spirit. We'll see that today in today's passage. And so we have that. And so we talk to one another and, and we speak to one another. I think, you know, what the Holy Spirit is saying and we hear together. And you can see how all three of those go together because when someone says, hey, I think maybe this, then obviously it has to align with God's word. And, and then you need to go and in prayer you know, as you're reading God's word, what are you saying to me? That's kind of a prayerful way of looking at his words. So all three go together. But there's the, there's the discernment process, okay? And so, so through that, kind of two things kind of came out. So I was talking to the elders and talking to some of you and seeking um, two things. One is that I think just to remind ourselves of God's love and grace for us is one. And we've been so focused on the mission, but one of the things that we need to keep in balance is a reminder that we, we, the mission we do, what we do is out of an overflow of what God has done for us, right? And so we show love to others when we're so incredibly amazed by, by, what, by the love that God has given us. We can't help but share it. We want people to know just how amazing it is, this love that God offers. When, when we realize how much we've been forgiven, then we can offer forgiveness, right? Then we want, like we realize we can't hold back forgiveness when we realize how great is the forgiveness that Jesus has given us. We give grace when we understand the grace we've received. And so that's one. It, it just, it, it keeps us from being Pharisees, right? That was Jesus' criticism. They did all the things that they were commanded to do, but Jesus said without love, you know? And so understanding God's love and grace is what will help us. It's, it's critical to us carrying out this mission that we've been talking about for nine months. 
right? So that's the that's the first thing. On uh, and the other thing with love and uh, love and grace, reminding ourselves of that is that we still live in a broken world, and many of you are going through. We all go through difficulties and challenges, and some of you are in really challenging situations, suffering in different ways. And we need to be reminded that there's a God who loves us, who's in control, and who cares for us. And so that was one of the things that as I talked to you and talked to the elders and prayed and saw, was one of the things I think God just wants to remind us of um, here. And then the second thing was God seems to be doing something with small groups. We just have so many people that are feeling God lay on their heart to start a Bible study or a small group or something. And, and for me, that really just connected with that. You know, the, the early church, we read that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to prayer and to fellowship, right? And what is biblical fellowship? It's that, it's that, it's the one another's, right? The, all those one another commands in the New Testament to love one another and forgive one another and all those things. And so that's, how do we do that? It's that deeper relationship with one another. When you're in relationship with someone and you share prayer requests and what's going on in your life and they hold you accountable and they encourage you and they support you and that's biblical fellowship. And so God seems to be so doing something in our church, I believe, and I've talked to a number of you, and you believe the same, in that area. And so those were kind of the two things. And so that's why I picked Ephesians, because Ephesians, the first two chapters, are really just soaked in God's love and grace. I mean, we'll see it. It's so, the, the passage we read today, it's so dense. <laughs> it's like a, it's just God's love and grace, and it carries on. Amazing two chapters. And then chapters three and four are really all about that unity and fellowship of the body and how we work together and encourage and build one another up. That verse is from Ephesians chapter four. And then chapters five and six are kind of the, some practical application of what, what happens. And so there, there's the intro to Ephesians. That's what we're going to be looking at for the next number of months. Um, and so um, today we're looking at basically Paul's introduction. He's, he's introducing this letter, and I'll do more maybe of the historical background, but just suffice to say, one of, one of your homework things, you got two weeks because John Stones are here next week again. So you got two weeks for some homework, okay, your doers of the word. One of them is go read Acts 19. Acts 19 is the birth of the church of Ephesus. And it's an incredible story. Paul was there for about two years, longer than almost any other place that he, any other church he planted. And that's the place where, if you, you ever read that, where even Paul's handkerchief, God was moving in such power that even Paul's handkerchief was healing people. It starts a riot because all the magicians, it was like the, it was like the Las Vegas of the then world. They had this massive temple, four times the size of the Parthenon in Greece. And so, anyways, it, uh, it was like, oh, they all start, all the magicians and stuff start burning their scrolls in the streets and, Anyway, so that's, that's the birth of the church, this incredible power, immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. It's another verse from Ephesians we'll get to. But uh, that's the birth of the church. And here Paul, this is about five, six years later, Paul's in a, in a prison in Rome, and he's writing, he wrote a number of letters from prison to all these churches, and he's writing this letter back to this group of people, this church in Ephesus, these people that he would have known and loved dearly, right? Some of these, some of the letters that we looked at, like, like Colossians, he'd never been there before, right? But Ephesus, he'd been with these people for two years, walked side by side as God did this incredible thing. And so he knows them. And so what does he say? What does he, you're going to really going to hear is Paul's heart as he just pours it out to these, these Christians. And so today is really just the introduction that we're going to look at. And what is it? That's kind of the idea. What is it that Paul wants to share with them? And we're going to see right off the bat, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Okay. How many people, if you're a saint, put your hand up. Oh, that's not what I expected. Good, good for you. I expected a lot more kind of kind of trying to, like, because when you think of saints, sometimes at our, if this, a saint, you would think maybe like Catholic Church, you know, some venerated thing from the past or or maybe like a Saint Teresa, we use it like, oh, she's a saint if it's a really godly person or something. But, but biblically, you're right. A lot of hands went up there because it's just really another term for Christian. I mean, Paul actually describes what saint is, those who are faithful in Christ Jesus. That's what a saint is. It's another word for Christian. And so he's, he calls them saints, Christians. And so really the question that we're looking at today is he's going to expand now on really what does it mean to be a Christian? Right? This is in his introduction, and that's our question for us this morning. Is I don't know if you've ever been asked that, if you ever thought through that. How would you describe it quickly? What does it mean to be a Christian? What's that mean? What does it mean to be a saint would be another way of saying it from, our, from the passage today. 
And so that's really going to be the core of the, the question for today. And Paul's going to go on the next from verse 3 down. He's going to go on. He's really just going to expand on that. What does it mean to be a saint? What does it mean to be faithful in Christ Jesus? Paul finishes his greeting in, in, in verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Kind of just like a prayer over this church. He goes, I, I pray that God's grace, that undeserved blessing that God gives, I pray that that is, is given to you. And then that peace, the, the Hebrew word shalom, that everything in its, is in its right place. The, the, your relationship with God is, is, is in a good, right place. But then also that just your life, you know, that there, there's a peace. There's a, as you go through life with God as a saint, as walking with him, peace, God's shalom, everything in its right place is with you. So this next section here this morning, why I wanted you to have a pen is how we're going to go through this is you... I don't know if anybody, in, in Greek, actually, it's one sentence from verse 3 to 10. So, in, in English translations, I mean, it is dense. And if anybody was like, oh, I get it right away, then, uh, um, yeah, it was a challenge. So, it's dense. So, what we're going to do is we're going to go through Paul. Again, this is an introduction, and so he's just, just pouring out his heart and just reminding, what does it mean to be a saint? What does it mean to be a Christian? And... And so we're going to go through, we're going to read through it a couple times, and we're going to, because he's going to go over these certain different, he's going to emphasize certain things several times throughout, over and over and over. And then he goes back and something else is emphasized, kind of almost like a spiral, over and over and over. And so we're going to go through it a couple times and just look at each one of those things that he emphasizes. Okay? And so the first one, the first thing that he really emphasizes is you see it right there in, in verse 1. Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. But then even more so in verse 4, even as he chose us in him. And so if you got your pen there, you can take your pen out. We're going to go through the passage and we're going to look at, you're going to see a whole bunch of times where Paul's just going to explain that how God is the absolute authority, how he's in control. It's going to talk about how God, it is his purpose. It is his will. It is he predestined, he chose those types of words. Okay, so if you got your panel, we're going to underline these ones. So let's just go through it quick and see, see what it says here. Um, so verse, verse 4 to start. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. He chose us. Verse 5, he predestined us. We're going to come back to that word in a moment. For adoption to himself through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. You can do the purpose of his will. You can underline that. To the praise of his glorious grace, with which he blessed us in the beloved. We jump down to verse 9. Making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose. And then down in verse 11, much the same. In him we have obtained an inheritance having having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will do you see any others those are the ones that i had and so we see throughout this this whole text here we have that it's his will it's his purpose he chose us before he even created the world before he even created the world, before the foundations of the earth were laid, he chose you to be a saint. He predestined us. Now there's been a lot of argument, especially over that predestined word. There's been a lot of argument as, as in Christianity as they try and look at, like, how can this be true that God is in this, this level, that he chose us before he created the universe? That he is by, everything is by his purpose and his will? How can that be? And yet we still have, how can we still have free will then? If God's in absolute control of it all. And there's been this debate, and to be honest, I think it's done far more harm than good. Because I think if you just look at your paper and everything that's, it, that's underlined there, I think the Bible is absolutely clear that God is in absolute control of everything. Past, present, future, already determined. He chose you before he even created the world. And it's just clear what the scripture says right god not only does he know the future he's out god is outside of time you could say god created time we can't even wrap our brains around that 
You have that like God created time. It doesn't. He doesn't even exist in it, right? It's that kind of a. That's how far outside, how in control He is. He's all present, all powerful, eternal, right? And to make Him to to lessen that in any way makes Him not God. Can you imagine a world where where God was reacting to every decision that eight billion people made? You know, like how would they, it's not possible. And so we know that God has to be in absolute control and authority over everything. And this should be a comfort to us, right? That we know that there's, because he chose you before the foundation of the world, there's nothing, no circumstance that's going to come up in this world that can take that away because he chose it before he even made it, right? He's in absolute control, absolute authority. But at the same time, we know that we have choice. And we're going to see that in verse 13, Right? Where it talks about after this big introduction and Paul gets to it and he, and he says, In him you also, when you heard the gospel of salvation, and you believed. You made a choice to believe. And so there's been so much argument how those two fit together. How can you have, how can you choose to believe while well, God is, in, and, and he chose? Well, it's kind of quite simple. God never told us to figure out how the two go together. That's the bottom line. He said, believe by faith this is who I am. And then he commanded us to make the right choice, to obey his commands. And there's no conflict there. You can believe by faith who he is, and you can obey the commands he gives you, and I promise you, you'll never have a conflict. It's only when you try and, with your puny brain, sorry, try and put those two together and try and think you got it figured out. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> Amen? And so that's the first thing. It's just, I mean, the scriptures, if you can come at it from that point of view, that we believe by faith who God is, absolute control of everything. It will give you such a sure foundation. And at the same time, know that you have a responsibility to obey the commands that he's given you. And that's how we live out the life as a Christian, as a saint. And it should give us comfort, like I said. <clears throat> you lost all my faith. He predestined you, verse 5, he predestined you. So you see verse 4, he made, he chose you before the universe. Nothing in this world can affect that. No situation that comes up. Verse 5, he predestined you to be his child. He's a loving father. Verse 9, he chose to reveal his amazing mystery, the plan of salvation to you. Right? God chose that in his authority, his power. And so if you're here today... Maybe you don't call yourself a Christian, right? It's not by accident that you're here. God wanted you to be here. He knew you'd be here. He knew you'd hear this. That's one of the beautiful things about the gospel, about the, the God being in control, is that this mystery of salvation, he's revealed it to you personally. And for, or maybe if you think back to when you were saved, right? God, that wasn't by accident. And you can look back, and the, many of our testimonies is exactly that. It's looking back, and we can see, all the ways, all the things God did to bring us to that point of salvation. And at the same time, we can see all the choices we made that led up to the same thing. Right? And that's the responsibility, but we can see God's hand in it all. And then verse 13, we see God's, he predestined us for, um, or verse 11. Verse 11, he predestined us for this inheritance, this eternal life. And so that's the other thing that God can't, or that no one can take away, that God has given us, has promised us, is this e eternal life. There's no circumstance that's going to come up because God's in absolute control. It's not going to get to some point where it's going to be like, oh, actually, you know what? I have to change my mind on this one. He's already determined it. He's already determined the eternal life that he's promised us, and we can, we can trust that. And so that's the first one. The first emphasis is, is just that God's in absolute authority. The second one, and go back through here again, is how is this all possible? It's only because we're in Christ. We see that right from verse 1. So this time, let's circle. We're going to circle every time we see any reference to being in Christ, in Him, referring to Jesus, in the Beloved. Any of those times as we go through, we're going to see it's almost like, I mean, there's a whole lot of talk about identity in our culture right now, right? This is like, this is our identity as Christians, is that we're in Christ, right? It's like, it's like, it's the, it's what anything you would use to describe what a Christian is has to come with the asterisk 
the, the qualifier that it's only because you're in Christ, right? That's kind of, that's to what level. We're going to see that as we go through. Paul qualifies every single thing he describes about us as saints. He's describing these saints, all the blessings they receive. And every single time he's like, it's only because it's in him, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Let's look at this. This is just, just amazing. Twelve times he's going to say it in just our short little section here. So verse 1, we're the faithful in Christ. That's what a saint is. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. And so every blessing that we have is only because we're in Christ. Right? It, 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 we wouldn't have those things. There would be no blessing if it wasn't for the fact that we were in Christ. And, and just to pause there, th that picture of in Christ, I've shared this before, but I just love that picture because it's that picture that we were, we were hopeless. We were lost in sin. We were, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We're going to see that in Ephesians 2 when we get there. Right? And then Jesus came to save us. And so the picture is that his righteousness, his perfect relationship with God, is like is wrapped around us we're like in him he's like covers us and so when god the father looks at us he sees the perfection the perfect relationship of his son right and so that's why everything we do like that's how he sees us it's because we're in christ that's why it's our identity that we're no longer sinners lost right that we're found in him that we're covered in him that's the picture of in christ and so all of our blessings, all these spiritual blessings, and it's going to go on to kind of list out what some of these blessings are. Verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless. So we're chosen in him. You can circle in him there. And what's, what our, what's our blessing? That we're holy and blameless. Once again, it's only because of Christ that we can be holy and, holy and blameless. We can't clean ourselves up we can't follow god's rules perfectly it's only because of jesus paying for our sin and giving us his perfect righteousness giving us his holiness that we can be holy and blameless we can't be live a perfect sinless life but he can and so it's only in him that we are found holy and blameless verse 5 he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through jesus christ you can circle the through jesus christ Right? And so our adoption into God's family is only through Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so it's only through Jesus that we can even come into God's family. We're going to see in the, later in Ephesians, Paul argues this. He, he's talking to the Gentiles. Ephesus was in modern-day Turkey. Gentiles, right? And he's, he's reminding them. He's going, look, it, you had no hope. God's chosen people were Israel, and you, weren't, you didn't cut it. You weren't part of it, right? Like, you had no chance until Jesus came. And then now he's opened it up and you can all be children of God only because you are in him, only through Jesus Christ. Verse 6, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. And the, the B will be capitalized because Paul's referring to Jesus. He gives Jesus this title. He refers to Jesus as the beloved, the, the, the loved one of God. I just love that. So you, can cir cir you can circle in the beloved. But I just love that because it reminds us that that we too are loved for God so loved the world that he sent his only son that God, the same love that God has for his own son, God the Father has for the son, he has for us. So just that amazing reminder that because we're in Christ, we are loved by the Father beyond measure, right? Willing to sacrifice himself. That's the love he has for us. Verse 7, it starts with it. In him, you can circle in him, verse 7. What do we have? What's the next blessing? We have redemption through his blood. This, this idea of redemption, the word there would have been, would have jumped out to them because back then slave, slaves were common. And, and so they, to redeem a slave was to, you would buy the slave, you would pay the purchase price for the slave and then, and then set them free. Right? And that was, that was how you would redeem a slave. And that's what Jesus did for us. By his blood, he purchased us. We had a debt we couldn't pay, a sin debt we couldn't pay. And his blood on the cross paid that. And then he set us free. And not only that, he redeemed us through his blood and he forgave our trespasses. And that word forgave is the, is the picture of sending it away. You know, like your sins as far as the east is from the west. 
It's that idea. It goes back to the Old Testament when they used to take, the priests would take the sins of the people of Israel once a year and put it on the scapegoat and send it out into the wilderness. That's the picture. It's this picture of, of God has, Jesus' death on the cross took our sins and took it as far away, gone, you know, removed them from us. That's the picture. So in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. We've been bought, freed, and our sins have been forgiven according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. I love that. Verse 9, making known to us the mercy of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. You can circle that one at the end of verse 9. And it kind of carries on into 10. As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, can circle the in him, things in heaven and things on earth. And so we have this picture. Not only do we get personal salvation because of Christ, because we're in him, right? But also God's plan is so much greater than that. It's to, it's to, we're, we're waiting for a new heaven and a new earth when there will be no more pain and no more tears and no more suffering and no more death, right? That, Jesus, that is also brought because in, uh, because of Jesus. He also brought that as well. And so we look forward to that day. Unfortunately, right now, we have to live in this broken world until Jesus comes, comes back. Come, Jesus. Come, Lord, come. Um, but we look forward to that day, and he brings that when we will, we will be with him forever in a new heaven, a new earth. And that, again, is only possible through him. And then we see that in verse 11. In him we have obtained an, an inheritance. So you can circle that in him at the beginning of verse 11. And then it's verse 12. So then we who were the first hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory that's that eternal life that we have guaranteed once again only because of jesus when he rose from the grave he proved that he can give us eternal life he demonstrated it right and then he went up he went up to heaven he told the disciples i'm going to prepare a place for you and uh and that's where we'll be we have that guaranteed again only because we're in him and then in verse 13 Again, Paul's just reiterating, kind of summarizing how this salvation, this incredible grace and love and salvation works. Beginning of verse 13, in him, you can circle, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in who? In him. Then you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. All those blessings, God in absolute control, and then all through, how do we receive all those blessings? Only through Christ. We're made holy and blameless, verse 4. We're adopted as sons and daughters into God's family, verse 5. We're redeemed and forgiven, verse 7. God's grace, verse 7 and 8, are, is lavished upon us. It's a free gift. We don't have to earn it. Pay God back. And then verse 11, we have this inheritance, this eternal life. And so what do we have to do to receive all of this incredible blessing? Well, if we see it right there in verse 1 even. Maybe you can star this or something. <laughs> this is how we can receive all these blessings. We be faithful in Christ Jesus. And Paul's going to explain it in more detail. Jump down to verse 13 again. This is how we can receive all these blessings. In him... You also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Again, I say that if you're here today and you're hearing this maybe for the first time or something's clicking, it wasn't an accident. Our, our God knew that you would be here. <laughs> he wanted you to hear this. Maybe it's for us as Christians, maybe it's something that he's been, the devotion you read, the song you sang, whatever it is, something if God's, tugging on your heart that's not an accident god's in control of that he's speaking to you are we listening when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation and believed in him that's just another way of saying and have to have faith in jesus in him it's in christ that we put our belief and we've seen a couple times here where, G, where Paul has referred to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I always remind myself, that's always such, just that title is always such a great reminder of, of the salvation message. 
because the word Christ is the same word as Messiah. One's Greek, one's Hebrew, right? And that always reminds me that when we talk about salvation through Christ, we remind ourselves that he's our savior, that there is no, the only way we can be saved is through him. Right? He paid the price for our sin. He paid the price that we couldn't pay. And so believing in him, receiving salvation, believing in him means that we actually believe that to be true. We really believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, that his death really did pay the penalty for your sins so that on that day when you stand before him, that there's not going to be any uh, anything else that you put your faith in, your trust in to say in that moment other than, Jesus, I put my trust in you, that I, you know me, I know you, I'm your child, I have surrendered my life to you. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. Your death on the cross paid for my sin. You've given me eternal life. That's why I am saved. And so that's the, that's the part that is, him is the Messiah, your Savior, your Lord, the only one that could be. But then that Lord part, that Lord means he's the authority. That's where the surrender comes in. It's not just a free ticket. It's not just a one-time, you know, transaction. This is the, a new life. You go from death to life and you begin to live out a new life where he's lord you're, you're done with trying to be the god of your own life and do it all on your own and make all your decisions and you, you know you surrendered completely your your life to him and he's now lord he's in charge that's what repent means it means to turn to turn from doing it your way doing what you think is right and doing it god's way repenting for asking for forgiveness for all those times you've rebelled and turning to him and so you believe in him, and when you do that, you're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. How incredible is it that, and we've talked about this for weeks, months, but how incredible is it? Jesus said, this is what the disciples were freaking out about. They were like, what, you're leaving? And he's like, it's okay. I'm, gonna, I'm still going to be with you, and I'll be with you to the end of the age. You know, I'm sending my Holy Spirit to dwell in you, and this is that new life is, is the very presence of God in our lives that we live out as saints. And, and so that Holy Spirit in us is the guarantee of our inheritance. Inheritance being our eternal life. Guarantee, that word there was like the same word they used back then for putting a down payment in a business transaction. Right? And today it's actually used for engagement ring in, in modern day Greek. Like it's that kind of a picture. It's like it's already bought and paid for. We don't, I don't have a ring on because I was drumming and it makes a weird sound. There we go. There's the example. So, <laughs> so, I mean, it's guaranteed. You know the date is coming, right? If you have an engagement ring on. Like, this is a sure thing. It's a down payment for this business transaction. We already we get to have it now. And uh, until we acquire possession of it. And so if you're here today and, and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, it wasn't by accident. And so I'd encourage you, all you have to do is talk to him. It's a personal relationship between you and him. Stop and pray. Say you ask for forgiveness for your sin, not just the bad things you've done, but an entire life of rebellion, trying to do it your own way and save yourself. Come to the only one that can save you, and that's Jesus. It's only because you're in him that you can be saved and be a saint. Come to him and you will find his love and his grace lavished upon you as he welcomes you in and guarantees an eternal life and seals it with that Holy Spirit. And then for those of us who put our hands up and said, yeah, we're saints. We've experienced that love, that grace. We know that inheritance is sure. What's the purpose in all that we do in, the, in, in this life, this Christian life for us? What's the purpose? Can you see it? He, Paul does it, says it three times. He repeats it three times in there. Let me see. What's the purpose? Glory to God. Thanks, Jake. You'll see it there, beginning of verse 6. Right? We were, you know, I'll go back to verse 5. He predestined us for adoption as sons, so there's our salvation, right? Why? Start of verse 6. To the praise of His glorious grace. You can, I don't know, squiggly line that one or put a box around it or something. To the praise of His glorious grace, all the way down to the bottom of verse 12, so that we who were first to hope in Christ Jesus... Why that we might be to the praise of his glory. 
And then he ends it, concludes his entire introduction at the end of verse 14 to the praise of his glory. And so that's our, that's our desire. Once we've experienced God's love and grace, we, we go out and we obey him and we serve him and we tell people about him for his glory. We want people to know how amazing our God is. It's for, we want to worship him. We want to sing out loud out here. We want his name to be known because he is worthy. It's all for his glory and his praise, not, not for us, not to make us look any better. It's all for his glory. And that's the introduction to Ephesians. And so um, our homework, like I said, you've got two weeks. And so on the back, actually, on the very last back page, I put it out there for you, the doers of the word for this week. Okay. And so a couple things there, like I said, with the second bullet point, read Acts 19, get some background. Um, you can also read 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, Paul's writing to Timothy to go be the pastor of Ephesus. So that's the connection there. Or Revelation chapter 2, the first bit of Revelation chapter 2, Jesus himself writes a letter to the church of Ephesus, which is kind of neat, amazing to read. Um, but Acts chapter 19 will give you the historical birth of the church in Ephesus, which will be good for the weeks to come. Um, but something else I'd like you to try, that first point there, I did this a number of years ago, and I, I still go back and reread it in my journal, and I find it, it still touches me every time, but I encourage you to read through Ephesians chapters 1 and 2 over the next two weeks a couple times. And, and, and then as you just kind of just soak that in, take a piece of paper and just write kind of like a personal letter to God, just a reflection of what you've read there. And I kind of just gave you an example just kind of from verse 3, basically. You know, it would be something like, I want to bless you, Father, and thank you, Jesus, my Lord, because of all the blessings you've given me. You chose me to be one of your children. Jesus, your sacrifice has made me holy and blameless. You kind of get the idea, and you just go through, and it just, just, it's just an opportunity for you to respond to what it means to be a saint, what God has done for you, and just praise him, worship him for what he's done for you. And so I encourage you to do that. I, I, I trust it'll be a really uh, encouraging exercise if you try that. And then lastly, let's look for opportunities to share this amazing message with those that we come in contact with. I'm going to pray. Lord, we, uh, we just marvel at your love and your grace that before you even created the world, you had this plan of salvation, that you were willing to descend, to put aside the glory of heaven, to come into this broken world, to take on the the weakness of human flesh so that you might live the perfect sinless life that we could never live as that example to us that then you could go and you would die on a cross to pay the penalty for our sin to pay the penalty that we couldn't pay and then you open your arms wide and you invite us into and a relationship with the almighty, all-powerful, eternal God. And you give us eternal life with you. And we look forward to that day when there will be no more tears and no more pain and no more death. And we can be with you fully and see you face to face and worship you forever. And so we just want to lift a, just a small portion of that praise um, up to you today. We thank you so much. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.